Today is a special day in many ways because we're almost at Thanksgiving. So we've been building up, we've been building up to this week of Thanksgiving when we connect with this uh, sermon series and really focus on gratitude and hopefully uh, just enjoying all the things that God has blessed us with and all the people of our lives and the gift of life. Uh, just a couple of announcements. One is that Crossroads House needs our help today. If you're willing to stay a little bit after the service at 10 o'clock, they'll be working in the fellowship hall back in the back uh, to move some of their stuff uh, from the containers into the fellowship hall for uh, their sale, their annual Christmas sale. So they just need some help maybe for half an hour if you're willing to give that uh, time following the service. And so um, I hope that you're able to do that. Today we're continuing, uh, this is as I said, this has been building up with a grateful sermon series. And we're at the last uh, Sunday. When, and, uh, but I hope and pray that you will continue with this uh, theme. This is not just for one time. And it was interesting that, uh, I didn't plan this by the way, it just happened that the Advent devotional, even though our theme is that is those who dream, the Advent devotional for this year is called Gratitude. I thought, interesting how the spirit works. Uh, so hopefully it'll help you. If you didn't pick one up, uh, you, you will pick one up and use it every day starting next Sunday. I give thanks today for Diana B Butler Bass and her book, Grateful, because it's inspired us to think about this theme in an active way, in a, a more robust way, and I hope that you've been using uh, the uh, booklets or the notebooks or your own uh, journals for uh, gratitude. And if you haven't started that practice, I hope you can. Uh, just every day, taking time to write down the things you are grateful for, the events or people or whatever God uh, makes you pay attention to. And so, uh, I want to invite you today to uh, join me in thinking about uh, gra gratitude as defiance. And to think about that in the context of last week's events. Uh, some of you might have been watching uh, the Rittenhouse uh, uh, trial and uh, the verdict that came, and there's a lot of emotion in our country over this. And it made me think about gratitude. I know a lot of people are not grateful about the outcome and are fearful. And there's a lot of division and it always, you know, pops up. There's something that pops up in our culture, in our time, that reminds us of the divisions, of the fears, of the hate that people could harbor against each other. And so today I want, I want to invite you to think of gratitude as defiance, as something that helps us uh, deal with these uh, with the root causes of what makes us hate each other. This morning, I uh, was looking at Facebook. I always check Facebook uh, to, on Sunday mornings to make sure that our events are lined up right. Uh, and then I was surprised to read a, a post by Diana Kassenbaum, um, who is a member of our community, sharing that somebody yelled at her and her husband, uh, get out of Batavia. And they're Jewish, so I'm really sensitive to that. It really hurt me this morning reading that, uh, being thrown at them. And so thinking about gratitude, being robust, being something that helps us deal with the root causes of things that we do to each other and the hate that drives us apart and drives us to not see each other as children of God. So I want you to, um, I hope I didn't depress you <laughs> already but to really think about it in that context, that it is difficult. It, we're not talking about gratitude and just, you know, we're forgetting about the realities of the world. It's because of the realities of the world that we need a practice that is strong. And so we'll begin this morning with a prayer uh, by uh, David Stendelrost. He is a, a brother and a teacher about gratitude. He really looks at gratitude as an important part of the spiritual journey. So we'll, uh, he talks about gratitude for the gift of this day. So I invite you to center yourself and enjoy this and open your heart to gratitude. Yeah. 
you think this is just another day in your life? It's not just another day. It's the one day that is given to you today. It's given to you. It's a gift. It's the only gift that you have right now. And the only appropriate response is gratefulness. If you do nothing else but to cultivate that response to the great gift that this unique day is, if you learn to respond as if it were the first day in your life and the very last day, then you will have spent this day very well. Begin by opening your eyes and be surprised that you have eyes you can open. That incredible array of colors that is constantly offered to us for pure enjoyment. Look at the sky. We so rarely look at the sky. We so rarely note how different it is from moment to moment with clouds coming and going. We just think of the weather. And even of the weather, we don't think of all the many nuances of weather. We just think of good weather and bad weather. This day, right now, is unique weather. Maybe a kind that will never exactly in that form come again. The formation of clouds in the sky will never be the same that is right now. Open your eyes, look at that. Look at the faces of people whom you meet. Each one has an incredible story behind their face. A story that you could never fully fathom. Not only their own story, but the story of their ancestors. We all go back so far. And in this present moment, on this day, all the people you meet, all that life from generations and from so many places all over the world flows together and meets you here like a life-giving water if you only open your heart and drink. Open your heart to the incredible gifts that civilization gives to us. You flip a switch and there is electric light. You turn a faucet and there is warm water and cold water and drinkable water. It's a gift that millions and millions in the world uh, will never experience. So these are just a few of an enormous number of gifts to which we can open your heart. And so I wish you that you will open your heart to all these blessings and let them flow through you, that everyone whom you will meet on this day will be blessed by you. Just by your eyes, by your smile, by your touch, just by your presence. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. And then it will really be a good day. Let us continue in prayer. Gracious God, you 
give us so many gifts each day. And so we give you thanks for guiding us, especially through the sermon series, helping us to become aware of your amazing presence in our lives. We pray today that you may continue to create to create in our hearts a deep center of gratitude, a center that grows so strong in its thanksgiving and sharing freely of our treasures that it becomes the norm and the pattern of our existence. Remind us often of how much you cherish us, of how abundantly you have offered gifts to us especially in the hours of our greatest need. May we always be grateful for your reaching into our lives with surprises of joy, growth, and unconditional love. We give you thanks this season for inviting us to give and to share by letting the cycle of blessings flow in and through us we dedicate today our gifts, our lives, our giving estimates, whatever we have to offer to you, to your service. May we always reach out into the world with your love, following in the footsteps of Christ. Amen. All right, so I was supposed to sing a couple songs for you this morning, but um, since there's been some technical difficulties and my music doesn't work, I'm going to sing a classic that still, I think, captures the gratitude we are covering in this sermon series and sounds a lot better a cappella. <clears throat> yes, we're not doing 10,000 Reasons, sorry. <laughs> we don't have the music. <laughs> You can sing along to this one, though. I'm sure most of you know it. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and see the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god shall come with shout of acclamation 
heaven and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art how great thou art how great thou art Amen. I love that she can just pull that out and <laughs> sing. <laughs> Thanks be to God for your gift and for sharing it with us. And so thinking about gratitude as defiance today, I uh, was thinking of one of the uh, favorite fictitious characters for children's literature, Winnie the Pooh. Uh, Winnie the Pooh is always hopeful, happy, and uh, life is going well. But Winnie the Pooh has another friend. One of his friends is Eeyore. Eeyore. We all love Eeyore. Why? We identify with Eeyore. We sometimes are Eeyore, or we know someone in our family who is an Eeyore. But Eeyore is also something about the culture. And so uh, I'm going to... Uh, share with you this video just my, luck. just my luck this is from Christopher Robbins if you haven't seen the movie it's it's a great movie but um, this is where he's floating down the river he's about ready to drown a half a lump leering at his lunch you're I'm not a half a lump doesn't matter anyway headed for the waterfall I'll be gone soon. Oh, no, not the waterfall. Swim! Not that anyone will notice. Swim, swim, swim! Just have to go with the flow. Don't worry. I'm not. Can't change the inevitable. You mustn't give up at all. I'll save you. We'll see. Oh, yes, of course. I've grown up, haven't I? <laughs> oh, heal! Laughing at my misfortune, just like a heffalump. Hello, Eeyore. Hello, heffalump. Not a heffalump. I'm Christopher Robin. Do you remember I used to try and cheer you up? I don't remember being cheery. <laughs> you could go on and watch this whole thing, but you can see every line is what? A downer, you know, just like life is tough. One of the lines is, why bother? You know, why bother? A lot of times that's just the way it is. And the funny thing, of course, in this uh, series and the Winnie the Pooh stories is one voice among many, and most of them are not like this. I think the difference for us is that this is the voice of our culture most of the time. This is the loudest voice we hear all the time. In the news, in the media, we are never enough, we don't have enough, or something is going wrong, and that's why it gets reported, actually. If it, if it is not bad, rarely does it get reported. And so that's what we hear, and that's kind of the, the mode. And the problem, of course, is that it locks us in a mentality of fear, of scarcity, of se sensing that it's just there is something wrong. Do you ever have this feeling that it's just nothing is going wrong in your life at the moment, but it's just not right? Something is just not right. You don't feel good. You, don't, you feel icky. And it's because around us, 
a lot of times I feel like I absorbed that stuff from just the culture. If you turn the news on, I know one person here who doesn't do it, and I heard about that. I'm like, I want to be like Brian Bromstead. I, I hear, his wife told me, it's like, oh, he just avoids all of this. I'm like, okay, how do you live in this world where you avoid all of this? He focuses on what he can do. Um, and, and he's always out there helping. And I'm not saying that we should turn off the, the news all the time, but there is some wisdom in not listening to that voice all the time. Uh, Diana Butler Bass says, we are like fish swimming in a polluted river. That's the culture around us. The chances are not very good that one healthy fish can survive in a poisoned stream. Thinking of the culture uh, being so polluted by forces of ingratitude or feeling that life is just one problem after the other. Uh, and then, you know, you hear the term, we're waiting for the other shoe to, why? Because that's how we are programmed all the time. You know, you're just, I'm doing well for now. You know, you, you we qualify, sometimes we qualify these things because we're really thinking something bad is gonna happen. And, and sometimes it does, and life does bring us a lot of challenges. But it doesn't mean that, it, that all people are bad, uh, that all situations are, are impossible, or there is no grace, even in the challenges. And so uh, today we're looking at Jesus. How did he deal with all of this? And how, how, what is this kingdom of God vision that he had in a world that didn't resemble the kingdom of God? And so we're going to read from uh, Luke 6. Uh, verses 27 through 36, and this is known as part of uh, the Sermon on the Plain. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is standing on a mountain, just like another figure who was teaching from a mountain, Moses. But somehow in Luke, it didn't matter. wasn't trying to compare Jesus to Moses, so G Jesus is speaking on a plain, not on a mountain. I don't. Location matters a lot of times in the Bible. So uh, because Luke is more that Jesus is with the people, so you hear that. I mean, this is one interpretation. So Jesus is giving people some instructions on life. You know, this is the ethic of the kingdom of God. And so he says, but I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. So the next time somebody talks to you about those people, no matter who those people are, think about these words and think about how this is really who we are. And this is not just uh, some kind of high and lofty way of being. It really is the essence of who we are. That's who God created us to be. Jesus was just reminding people. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. And uh, this is where you say, okay, I'm done being Christian. What? This is so impossible, it seems like. Because, again, think of this, the water we're swimming in, the culture. What do we learn? Treat people as they treat you. Don't, you know, don't expect me, you know, what do we always talk about? Uh, you know, you're going to get what you sow. You know, you reap what you sow. And we think of uh, the ethic of just returning what people are doing to us. Well, I, they, if you're a kid, if you had uh, siblings, if you're lucky to have siblings in your life, 
growing up? What was, the, what was the ethic at home when there was a problem and the parents show up? What did you, what was your first line of defense? It wasn't, wasn't me, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> he started it. It was always, I always, that was my line of defense. He started it, he hit me. And so all I was doing was just defending myself. And it was, in, and it starts there. But we grow up to think that's just the way it is. That's how we, that's how we undo evil. It's just we're going to return. Well, we're going to take, uh, if, if they come at us, we're going to go after them. We're not going to just sit there and die. And of course, you know, some people analyze these teachings of Jesus and look at it as not just a passive way of dealing with evil, but really uh, un disarming it and really being more proactive, uh, and Jesus really being a nonviolent resistor. And there's more to this, but generally, the whole overall picture is very different than what we normally think of. The way we defend ourselves, the way we go after people, or the way we uh, hold grudges. Uh, do you ever hold grudges? We do. Why do we do that? Why do we hold a grudge? Because we're hurt, and it, and it really is very painful to let go of that hurt or to move on, or in the case of the culture, if there are ba big issues like racism, how do we deal with them? It just really is very painful to watch these things in action. But Jesus invites us to uh, look at the root causes of the problems. And one of the, th one of the issues uh, that he deals with is that this was a culture just like ours. It's, it was about a quid pro quo. So if you do this to me, I will do it to you, whether it's good or bad. And then there was a benefaction system. So people gave because you know, there, people were defined by how much they gave to the poor or to those who, who were benefiting them. So they would praise them in public, you know, look at this person, you know, look how much they gave, or uh, this person gets uh, a, a special kind of place in society. And the big benefactor was the emperor himself. He was seen as the son of God because he was giving, he was choosing who would get it. And those who were believed to be useless, they couldn't really even return the, uh, the gratitude or the favor by saying, uh, you know, thank you in public. They were left out of that system. So Jesus was dealing with this system and saying, but it's not about that. This is, this is what we built. This is what humanity believes. But this is not God's vision for the world. It is not God's vision when you read the story of creation. God set it up where we would share, where there is plenty for everyone, and that it's a world of abundance. And I love the last bit of what Jesus uh, talks about here. Uh, God doesn't, does, doesn't look at those who are uh, grateful or good and says, okay, I'm just gonna give those some sunshine, and those are gonna get the snow. It must be we're wicked, because we get a lot of snow here. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, in, in that mentality, you say, well, it's just those who are good are gonna get the good things in life. But we know that bad things happen to good people. We know that good things happen to bad people. It's not that way. It's, it's not that system, and so, it is an invitation. Gratitude is an invitation to disarm, to dismantle this system of quid pro quo and to move into loving generously like God does by seeing the potential in all. And so seeing the potential in all people, and this is hard. This is, I, I, I totally understand how difficult it is to see the potential, to not get into the, you know, Emmeline said this to me, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show her. Um, it, it, to not get into all of that in daily life is very difficult. And as I said, the culture around us is that way. But it can lead us from death to life, from fear to freedom. And it is a lifetime of practice. It is a lifetime of practice. Last night, uh, I was reading an article, and uh, the title was, What Makes You Happy? What are the things that make people happy? And there were three things. And I was like, yay. Okay, it's not winning the lottery. 
what do you think? But be, actually, it's funny because they said, you know, actually winning the lottery after a while is just like, you know, the, the house you really wanted to buy or the car you wanted to buy or the job you wanted to get or the relationship you wanted to establish. All of this just after three months, it's just like everything else. It doesn't make you happy. The three things were purpose. Number one, purpose. Having a sense of purpose in your life. Gratitude. And no, actually, the second one was giving, and then gratitude. Giving was the second one. And so it's interesting that Jesus was talking about this debt system that was established where uh, it was against God's vision. This is w from Exodus. This is when the people of God were uh, being relieved of slavery in Egypt, and they were given those teachings if you lend money to, to my people, to the poor among you, you shall not deal with them as a creditor. You shall not exact interest from them. So why? Why charging the interest is bad? Because it creates a system where some people would never be able to pay back. And there was a system of every seven years relieving debts, forgiving debts again. Uh, even if you fall on hard times, there is another chance and always another chance. To, so to think about that, Jesus was disarming, dismantling the whole system. This is how God set it up. And Jesus was reminding people that if we keep systems that keep people hostage to uh, systems of poverty or ways of uh, abusing and, and uh, taking advantage of each other, we are going to lose it's just not the way God envisions the world. In Christ's vision for the world, our status is defined by our belonging to God. So back to the first sermon about gratitude. When we talked about the struggle of gratitude, uh, that it is hard to be grateful because we tend to think of gratitude as something for only good things. Instead of thinking, it's because I'm alive. I belong to God in life and in death we belong to God. And that's really the source of our gra gratitude. That's the source of who we are, our worthiness. Who we are is based on God's love for us, God's generosity, that we are just here by the grace of God. Nothing else. All the, the, the scurrying and the trying to control life and all the stuff that we do is just a lot of times a waste of time and energy. It's about living in that grace, remembering that. Uh, a negative example that came to my mind this, this week was, uh, I don't know if you read the news where they had to shut down the schools in New Delhi in India, and it wasn't because of COVID, it's because of pollution. Look at the air quality, the children just, you know, in order for them not to be outside, this is what happens. I mean, this is just a, like an exaggeration of what happened, but, but this is what happens when we don't think that the common good, that we belong to each other, that we are connected, this is what happens. We just start thinking of ourselves. And of course, there are many manifestations in our own culture, so I'm not picking on India. It was just a story in this past week that caught my eye. I thought they were closing the schools because of COVID but it's because of the air quality. And to think, you know, how we do that to ourselves because we are only thinking of now, of my benefit, not your benefit, not the common good, and not the gift of air. The quality of air, the quality of water, the quality of life, uh, the many gifts that we take for granted and abuse and exploit so we can just benefit and get the things that don't even make us happy. And this is the sad thing when you think about it. If the three things that really make us happy are purpose, giving, and gratitude, what are we wasting our time on? And so today I want to invite you to uh, think about the Christian ethic of uh, the whole idea of just that we share. This is who we are, and this is what uh, Diana Butler uh, Bass says, but I say also in that sense that 
when we give, and this is the season of stewardship when we, we've been looking at giving, but one of the things that are really important in, this, in the practice, in the spiritual practice of giving as well, is that we need to think about the fact that when we give to the church, it's not because we're giving to a club. Like, you, are you, do you belong to a club or uh, like a gym or any group where you have to pay dues? What do you expect when you pay dues? Services. Services. You're going to get something for your money because you paid. You should be able to go use the stuff and, and it's yours because for that fee, that's the social contract. The social contract of a church is that it's about giving. We give and so we can go out and serve. We give because God is calling us to do that. We are here so we can support the ministries of groups like Crossroads or the Children's Center or Jackson School. We try all the time to not think only of what, what we do here, but to really equip each other and empower each other, to, to bless each other, to go out and to serve, to love the world. That's our work. That's our work, and it's really counterintuitive. And so this is uh, what Diana Butler Best says about uh, gratitude as defiance. She says, gratitude is defiance of sorts, the defiance of kindness in the face of anger, of connection in the face of division, and of hope in the face of fear about these words, how powerful they are. When you are grateful, when you are practicing that day in and day out, and a lot of times we want to change the world out there, but first, the world has to change in here. It's not going to change if we don't change. And I always, always cringe when I hear that. I'm like, oh, I want to fix all the people out there. What about, oh, I have a problem too. And not only that, but if we don't access that sense of gratitude within us, we burn out. If you get involved in social justice stuff, after a while it, it makes you really tired because you see things that people do that are so hurtful. And it's hard not to hate. It's hard to practice love your enemies when you're in your face to face with the enemy. Gratefulness does not acquiesce to evil, and I love this, it resists evil. The re that resistance is not that of force or direct confrontation. That's our first instinct, is like go stand in their face, you know, cause a problem. But gratitude undoes evil by tunneling under its foundations of anger, resentment, and greed. I love the image. Think about it, tunneling under its foundations. Thus, gratitude, gratitude strengthens our character and moral resolve, giving each of us the possibility of living peaceably and justly. Gratitude invalidates the false narrative that these things, pain, suffering, and injustice, are the sum total of human experience. That despair is the last word. Gratitude gives us a new story. A new story. Think about the, that story that you know we were talking about, the Eeyore-type story to really think, shift the story. And so uh, I hope as you walked in, I see some of those yellow sheets. You got some of those yellow sheets. If you didn't, uh, is there a, uh, oh, Donna, you're the greeter today. If you don't mind sharing some of those, and uh, there is a prayer of, for Thanksgiving dinner. Any of you are having Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, everybody is, okay. All right, hopefully nobody is alone, but if you choose to be alone, that's, that's also okay. You could use the prayer. It has a prayer from Diana Butler Bass for uh, Thanksgiving, and so this is, will be, you could pull it out, and uh, this way your family doesn't have to endure for a long, long, wandering, meandering kind of prayer, but it has uh, some good substance to it. But also, there is a list of organizations in our community, and you could, you could pick your own organization. It doesn't have to be one of these. But just, I thought, uh, for the practice of gratitude to not just be in our hearts, but to move us to think about the groups in our community that work for good. Uh, so you can pick one or two. You can find another group. But just the invitation is to write a thank you card from you 
as part of the church. So he's saying, you know, your name, and then you could say from Batavia First Presbyterian Church. You know, think about making it personal. What, why do you believe that, say, uh, Crossroads House is of benefit to our community? Some of you might be saying, what is Crossroad, uh, Crossroads House? Find out. If you're joining us online and you're in a different location, find out about the groups in your community that do a lot of good. Uh, and again, this is not a comprehensive list. This, these are just the, peop the groups that came to my mind. And you may be saying, well, there are missing groups. And if you'd like cards, Matthew is helping uh, hand out cards if you'd like to send cards so that you don't have to go to the store and buy a card. There are cards here. Uh, so take time to express gratitude and see, see how that impacts the people. And the invitation is also at um, your Thanksgiving table this year. Instead of talking about whatever you, or you know, forcing people as uh, Diana Butler Bass calls it, uh, turkey hostage, holding the turkey hostage you know, until you share something you're grateful for. Talk about this group. Talk about this group that you picked and why you picked it and why you're grateful for it. So it just gives you something uh, different to focus on. We might need more. Okay, we may have to have uh, to go into the office and find more. Um, but thank you for doing that. So uh, also another thing. So today was like the multitude of things that you received as you walked in. There were little cards. I see, Tress, would you, uh, Jeff, I'm sorry, I always call you Tress <laughs> by your last name. He's, he's a teacher. <laughs> You're more of Tress than Jeff. Would you mind uh, holding up your card? You don't need, yeah, that, that one. Okay. So that's the card you received that. So I'm going to invite you to turn to your neighbor for a few minutes and uh, share that blessing there are two different sides to it. I mean, there are two sides. Of course, there are two sides to any card. But there are words on both sides. And so choose which side you're going to share with your neighbor. Share it as a blessing. And if you don't feel like sharing, that's fine. You don't have to share with anyone. You could just say, read the words and, and pray them. Uh, and think about how, uh, share, you know, what it, this blessing means to you or ask them what it means to them. So we'll take a couple of minutes to share that. All right, thank you for sharing this. And you may continue to do that. I know it feels awkward at first to share blessings with others, 
But it's a very powerful practice to bless somebody, to pray for someone, to say, God bless you. I appreciate the gift of your life. Um, and so we're going to end with another video. F I hope it's okay. Is it okay to, to end with another video from yeah. David Stendhal Rust? You give me permission to do that? Okay. It's, a, it's called Blessings. So again, I invite you to take that as a blessing for this day for you. Bless what there is for being. Whatever it be, bless it because it exists. You need no other reason. Source of all blessings, you bless us with breath. In and out, in and out, ever renewing us, ever anew, making us one with all who breathe the same air. May this blessing overflow into a shared gratefulness so that with one breath I may praise and celebrate life. Source of all blessings, you bless us with humility, that down-to-earth quality that has nothing in common with humiliation but makes us stand tall and acknowledge both the humus that feeds us and the stars to which we aspire. May I learn to practice and to honor in others this sparkling humility, which is the dignity that we as human beings cannot afford to lose. Source of all blessings, you bless us with imprecision. With all that is vague, close but not quite, all that leaves room for the more specific, the more precise, and room for imagination. May I know when to be exact and when to move freely and blessed in the space so generously provided by all that is not perfectly defined, giving full scope to my dreams and my creativity. Source of all blessings you bless us with memory, that sacred ingathering of the past that allows us to recognize faces, learn poems by heart, find our way back when we are lost, and bring forth old and new from its nearly inexhaustible store. May I know what to forget and what to retain, and treasure keeping in mind the smallest kindness shown to me and spreading its ripples for a long time to come. Source of all blessings, you bless us with change. In the seasons of the year, from snow to greening, flowering, fruiting, and harvest. In the seasons of life, from childhood to youth, full ripeness and saging. All living things keep changing. May I welcome change as a sacred opportunity to grow and savor in each unrepeatable moment in its fleetingness what is beyond change. 
Source of all blessings, you bless us with departures, for they are a necessary part of our journey, necessary for the arriving. May I always be ready to take leave, always aware that every arrival is a prelude to departure, every birth a step towards dying. And may I thus taste the blessings of being fully present where I am. May blessings help to sharpen your taste for the gift of life in its immeasurable facets. May you grow ever more blessed, ever more able to bless. Amen. Are you singing another song or no? You're good? Okay. No, one a cappella song, you could just, okay. <laughs> so friends, for the blessing today, we've been using this blessing every week and I pray that the words are familiar with your soul and if you're hearing them for the first time, may they also speak to you about the power of gratitude. I know the sermon series is ending, but gratitude is a spiritual practice for every day. So may gratitude unlock the fullness of your life, may it turn what we have into enough and more. May it turn denial into acceptance, chaos into order, confusion into clarity, problems into gifts, failures into success, the unexpected into perfect timing, and mistakes into important events. May gratitude help us make sense of our past, Bring peace for today and embrace the divine vision for our tomorrow. Go in peace, my friends, to serve and love the Lord and to be grateful. <laughs>